is really not a silent world if you know how to tune in on it. With an instrument called a hydrophone, an underwater microphone, you can listen to the sounds made by sea life. In fact, to anything that goes on in the ocean. I was testing a very special set of highly sensitive hydrophones which I had rigged up as a unit. To my underwater phones, a whale sounded like blasts on a tuba. Friendly seal sounded like a dog barking. A playful school of porpoises reminded me of schoolgirls chattering. And this school of fish sounded like galloping horses. I was making recordings of these sounds. Later, scientists at marine land of the Pacific would play them back at different speeds and analyze them to help solve some of the mysteries of the sea. I didn't know that before the day was over, I'd be using my hydrophones not to study common marine life, but I'd be using them to try to solve one of the strangest and most dangerous mysteries that I've ever encountered in the ocean. The slate said urgent, up. A message had come from my friend Ernesto Santilla, a marine specialist asking me to fly immediately to Punta Serena on the coast of Baja, California, and to bring all my underwater equipment. Several hours later, we were over Bahia Blanca on the coast of Baja, California. As we came in for a landing, I kept an eye out for anything unusual. I didn't see anything. We landed in the bay and taxied toward Punta Serena. Ernesto had left a truck and instructions for me in town. An hour later, I drove up the beach into his research camp. Tanks, hydrophones and all. Hello, Mike. I'm glad you came. Ernesto, nice to see you again. Mike, did you see anything from the sky on your way in? Well, I saw a lot of things. I saw some uh, whales near the bay. No, no, no. You saw nothing else unusual? No, nothing. What do you walk toward the area of the channel near the islands? No. What's wrong? Come with me. I want to show you something. I'd like you to look at that net. It's got a hole in it. So unusual about that. This man, Julio, is prepared to swear that this hole was made by something... by something as if from another world. A sea monster. Sea monster? That's right, a sea monster. He describes it as being so powerful that it makes the whales leap from the waters in fear. Well, a killer whale will do that too, you know. He says it set up an underwater turbulence that made the bell buoy in the channel ring as if the devil himself had hold of its tongue. You actually get a look at this sea monster? Si, sí, si, sí, senor. He describes it as having long wild hair and eyes that burn. No, these are reliable men. They have been professional fishermen for 20 years. I know them both. They are very, very certain of their story. You see it too? Hernando had seen it the day before, at exactly the same place, at exactly the same time of day, 4.30. So they think it may come into that area at that time to feed. They differ in one way. Hernando saw no streaming hair. He describes it as being uh, shining and circular, like a flying saucer. But they only got a quick glimpse of it, huh? Yes. These ends look like they've been cut. Yes, Mike. If it were not for this net, believe me, I too would discount the story. 
do you know how much impact would be needed by whatever hit that net to snap those cords that way? More force and strength than any water creature that has lived for at least a million years. You got the time? All right, it's not 4.30 yet. Let's get that plane and go up and take a look, huh? I went up again in the amphibian for some aerial reconnaissance. We were over the bay again, and this time I had an idea where to look, in the area of the channel. But I still didn't know what I was looking for. Far below us, we could see many whales swimming lazily near the surface. We came down close to the water to get a good look at them. Nothing seemed unusual. All of a sudden, a huge whale leaped out of the water as if terrified. Then another. And another. The whole herd was running and leaping in panic. We couldn't see what was causing it all below the surface. But there was something. I couldn't doubt that anymore. We went back to the camp to study the problem. We considered every possible angle. We studied charts calculated currents, and consulted many of Ernesto's books. We knew that many supposedly extinct sea creatures had been discovered alive in recent years. Still, I couldn't accept the idea that any sea monster could create such a turbulence, panic a herd of whales, or push right through a heavy-duty net. Ernesto couldn't accept it either. But what other explanation was there? I decided that there was only one thing to do. Collect data on it right there in the water as it passed. We might be able to get a look at it, or even photograph it. And with my hydrophones, we could at least record sound data on it. Julio agreed to be our guide. To solve this mystery of the sea, we were ready to risk our equipment, and perhaps our lives. We got to the channel early the next morning. That gave us many hours to prepare, but we didn't know what we were preparing for. As we loaded the dinghy, I realized how wise Ernesto was when he asked me to bring all my equipment. My experimental hydrophones would now be our underwater ears. We agreed to place them at specific angles and depths in relation to each other. Each phone had its own miniature transmitter, broadcasting to the receivers, meters, and tape recorders aboard the Teresa. By comparing the sounds and intensities and making some calculations, we could chart the course, the depth, and speed, perhaps even the size of anything that passed through the channel. Julio rode me around in the dinghy as one by one I carefully set out the units of our underwater sound network. adjusted the floats and cables, I made a final check on the connections, the directions and distances. When I returned to the boat, Ernesto was already testing the system and was ready to work the controls.
How's it working? Listen. Yeah, that's fine. You are not going into the water again, Mike. Yeah. I just changed my tanks. These are full ones. The time is now too close. It will be too dangerous until we know what we are dealing with. Well, that's why I want to get a good look at it. I can see much better down below. The boat is the safest place for all of us, Mike. I will not consent. You brought me down here because I'm supposed to know my job. Let me do it, huh? My way. Yeah. As I swam down to what I hoped would be a safe spot, I began to feel that Ernesto was right. It would be dangerous. But nothing could take the place of a face-to-face -face look. And whatever it was, it was bound to be something that I'd never seen before. Maybe something no man had ever seen before. I found a good spot and waited. Aboard the Teresa, Ernesto and Julio waited too, as the minutes ticked by. If the pattern remained the same, it would be on top of us in a few minutes. I wondered what I would do about it if it was something out of the depths. But even if I had wanted to change my mind, it was too late now to get back to the boat. I felt a faraway vibration in the water, and I heard an eerie sound. Whatever it was, it was on its way. I braced myself and set the camera. I figured that no matter what happened to me, I might still get a photograph. Perhaps something of tremendous scientific value. Henry! It comes! Even the whales are afraid! The turbulence hit me like a pile of bricks. There was no fighting it. My body was tossed around like a feather. I was turned over and over. I knew that I wouldn't be able to get a picture, or even a look. I wondered if I lived to tell what had happened to me. I was underwater to get a look at Julio's sea monster. Instead, I was almost finished by the turbulence that it caused as it passed, and I had seen nothing. My watch told me that I had lost track of several minutes. I was lucky that I hadn't drowned. I was dazed and exhausted, but otherwise unharmed. As I surfaced, I looked around for some trace of the thing, but saw nothing.
What is it? What did you see? Nothing. It came too fast. It was like being caught in a terrific underwater current. Oh, boy. Throw me around, knock me over. I didn't even get a chance to take a picture of it. When I finally got up, it was gone. What about you? Did you see it? Well, we saw something different and really did not see anything. You are right, Michael. Its speed is fantastic. Nothing is sure. But the hydrophones picked it up from the beginning. After you rest, Mike, we'll play it back and start our analysis. Okay. Now, compare what you just heard with our tape recording of the sound coming from hydrophone number five. The volume here is at least three dBs less. That puts it even further to the left side of the channel. That's right. Right about in here, would you say? Never nearer than 20 feet from the surface. It sounds to me like it could be some form of that fish which you call sculpin. They have that strange metallic hum and ring, too. Look at the course this thing takes. Come straight in from the sea to the spot where we've been observing it. And it makes a perfect 90 degree turn. Every time in the same place. That's a smart sea monster. Every time I listen to this thing, I can't help but think that... Now, you've got at least a half a dozen reinforced nets aboard, haven't you? We have eight, Mike. Well, if it's okay with you, I'd like to stretch all eight of them in a row, one right behind the other, across the channel. Starting from this point. Right here. So as to slow it up just long enough to get the real look at it, huh? That's right. Maybe take a picture of it, too. And if I'm lucky, even disable it. At least it'll give us a chance to find out what we're up against. We can keep it there for just a half a minute. Well, what do you say? You willing to risk those nets of yours? I'm afraid it'll probably go through the first three or four of them, but uh, I think the rest of them will hold it. Yes, Mike. If you will agree this time to stay on board with us. Until we have something in those nets, then I'll go down and take a picture of it, huh? Okay. Well, we have until 4.30 tomorrow. We've got a lot of work to do. Let's start rigging those nets, huh? We worked the rest of the day and all of the next, rigging the nets. We finished just in time. We were watching the meter, which measured overall vibrations. If a net was hit, the needle of the meter would jump. It was almost time. Hit the first net. The second. And the third. But the fourth had a different sound. It seemed as if the thing was hanging there. I knew that I might have only seconds in which to look at it. As I sped downward, I wondered what was waiting for me in the fourth net. There was a clean hole in the first net. I swam through it. Then through the second. And 
through the third. And then I saw it. It looked like a mass of foaming bubbles. It wasn't any sea monster from out of the deep. It was a man-made monster. And one of the strangest devices that I had ever seen. At first, I could hardly believe that so small an object could have created such tremendous turbulence. But as I approached it, I understood better. Even with its power cut down by the damage it had suffered in the nets, it writhed, twisted, and strained like some live creature. I tried to find some way to put it out of action. I pulled on one of the antennae. It came off easily, and the pressure diminished slightly. Something has happened. That sound is not as strong. See? Then I pulled off another, and the whole mechanism quieted down. I examined it carefully to see if I could discover what propelled it, and to satisfy myself that I had really disabled it. Now, for the time being, we have to request your strictest silence concerning this object. Later on, there may be an official announcement. Yeah, we understand. You sure that's what this is? It has every appearance of being an underwater satellite, built to orbit underwater in the same way that other satellites orbit in space. But how can so small an object cause such a tremendous turbulence? By its tremendous speed. And I must get that speed by using the, uh, using the pressure of the water itself for propulsion. Yes, I agree, senor. Uh, that's pretty ingenious, huh? You know that 90-degree turn you spoke of? Huh? Well, that's undoubtedly accomplished by the presence in here of an instrument which beams off these antennae and is set to automatically veer it away from any sizable solid object, such as a, a coastline or a breakwater. But what is it doing down here in our bahia? Got a theory about that. I, uh, I drew a straight line down the coast, past San Francisco, Los Angeles, San Diego, down to this bay. I see. This is the first point at which the coast of Mexico projects out far enough to make it turn. That's right. So you know that could explain some of those strange sonar alarms and signals we've been getting the last couple of days in our coastal defenses. A thing like that could cause a lot of confusion, and in the wrong hands, armed as a weapon, tremendous danger. Have you any idea where it might have come from? Well, there is no one country which has a monopoly on scientific research these days, Mr. Nelson. This could have been developed by any one of a dozen countries, large or small. But we'll know after we've examined it further. And we'll know what to do. Hey, amigo. What are the burning eyes and the long, wild hair? Well, the eyes... They must have been these two light sensitive discs. I don't know what that uh, wild flowing hair could be. Yeah, it must have just passed through a kelp bed. That's what you saw, it was kelp on there. Ah, see, si, see. Si. <laughs> you know, I don't blame you for thinking that it was something from another world. And who can say, with all that is happening today, that he was so very far wrong? Back next week at the same time with another sea hunt story. Plan to be with us again, huh? <laughs>